about food sovereignty. I bet there are some very interesting specifics. But there's all sorts of these laws that make what we want to do illegal. So if you want to process a chicken, back before, I think it was in 96, the Ohio legislature passed the law. Like I was uh, raising and processing chicken on the farm and take it to the farmer's market. Well, they simplified things after that. And now they'll go home to Indiana and bring back different firms that went out of business because of these new little rules that try to make us a small firm work like a multinational. We have the, the safety standards, like you have stainless steel and all these different things that you really don't need. If you're processing once a week and you have sunshine and air to take care of possible pathogens. Nutrient dense foods is another thing. That we write an ordinance that would promote the growing of nutrient dense foods. We have the knowledge in this area. We have the Bionutrient Food Association. And this is something up and coming because food quality is poor. And if you go back to the 1965 uh, USDA, they keep track of all these different foods. And like an apple that you purchase then, today you have to eat three to get the same nutrition. So our food quality is very degraded. In fact, we have food and drug, the medical profession is taking over as the biggest driver of the economy because people are not healthy. And we need to redirect our legislatures and tell them what we need to be doing instead of, we have this big disconnect. The food industry doesn't care about health and the medical profession doesn't care about food. So we've got to fill that gap. Do you think that the county charter would be especially helpful to organic farmers? Well, we've got people that are pretty poor trying to start out. It would be nice to have a way to fund them and get startups. And there's different vehicles to do that, too. If they, uh, like, I have a difficult time getting people to take the soil test to know what to amend when you get into trace. They're doing a good job, they think, but they really don't know. So there's ways to incentivize it, just how do you write it? And this could help any farmers, right? Any small farmers? Sure. And I've got a uh, small farm as well. We've got 50 head, 50 head of pig and 200 chickens, and all of which, if I butcher at my house, and with a full stainless steel tables, the whole bit, the meat, that part of the restriction, I still think I'm not allowed to sell it. Only I can sell it off my farm, but that's it. I can't go to the farmer's market. I can't sell it to any local businesses. Nothing. And hope, I would hope that the county charter could do something like that and give some of that power back to us for where I actually could sell chicken anywhere. Um, or just even make it available to where I can get my chickens closer in Athens County. Because yeah, right now, you have to drive this quick in the end to get a butcher and go from all the way back just to sell in the farmer's market or anywhere in town. That that part absolutely does me. It hinders me being able to grow. It's really about it. Outside of the municipality of Athens, and all of the foot traffic and danger. So I was wondering whether if this uh, charter is adopted, this can be used as a, a selling point that we can, as a the municipality of, of Athens County, regulate Milner's Fest. I have the same question if we're going to have a charter, what else would it do for us? Well, it turned out to be a very rich and rewarding discussion, and not every problem will be solved by having a charter. In the context of the discussion about what the charter can do, we start discussing what we can do as citizens to make our lives better, and, and, and if the charter may or may not be involved. But the idea is that by organizing, we can, we can perhaps get something done. We never heard a group, and uh, her, uh, her colleagues uh, have done a lot in terms of uh, lobbying. And I think they're doing some work with that. But something that really important came out of uh, my discussion, I went and talked to them one afternoon about this. But the problem with the Riverfest is that it's outside the city limits. So I think city council and mayor cannot just simply make a rule. It's actually a contract, as I understand it, between the organizer of this Riverfest and the landowner. And, and there's really no jurisdiction from the point of view of county commissioners. They can't do anything because the state doesn't tell them what to do under the statutory system. They live in the Numberfest area and this network folks, they all live in Athens Township. Athens Township is 
actually almost 7,000 people. If you look at the books, a town of that size can actually have its own charter. They could become a charter township. What they would have to do is simply organize and petition, and if they had enough votes, they could actually establish a charter. So that now with the charter, they could pass laws in relationship to number fest. That would have had a real advantage because it's local. The problem with the county charter and the number fest is the county is 65,000 people spread out between uh, you know, Nelsonville and Carthage, and it's only uh, the folks in Athens that even know about it. As far as I know, the Athens News is going to deliver to Troy and, and Cool. So trying to get the whole county to vote on the number fest is going after a mouse with an elephant gun. What you need is local control. The commissioners, since they don't have a charter, they don't have their own uh, power. But in fact, the township also doesn't have any power in everything. But they could if they became charter. So this would be an example of woo Cities in action, discussing how to make their lives better, finding creative ways to uh, deal with these kinds of issues, and to make the decisions as local as possible. Number, number of is going to be a local issue. The real problem is that there's no jurisdiction for that. The problem is that the line that is between the city and the county, and just nobody in charge of that circle of interest. Having a charter means that we are thinking about what we can do to improve our lives. We know we can have an invention for us because we spend it that way in our These other things may or may not actually require a charter, but they but will become discussed in creative ways, increasing our local self government. Where is the lady from the neighborhood group? Would you like to speak to that point? Well, I just want to let people know just how dangerous number fest is. I think people do us that. I live across the street from him and watch the emergency squads wade through a sea of drunk people to get into the venue in order to take people out of the venue. And um, I thought that they would probably take him down Radford Road because even though it was a much longer route, it seemed like an easier way to get to the hospital. And I think it does affect everybody in Athens County because not only do they close State Route 56, which the sheriff assured me the week before Number Fest this year that they would not do that again, but it happened again. And um, it, it walks them out to the hospital. So everyone in Athens County should be concerned that they can't get to the hospital. I think that's the biggest issue. There's also a lot of issues. It was an international fair in town. People were, people were just ridiculously drunk, urinating everywhere. They were in my yard. It was worse than that some of my neighbor children. And, um, and, and I had a little paper from Fest 6 where they had, uh, I think, 20 quarter pots for 15,000 people. This year they supposedly had 24,000 people and they had 30 quarter pots and they went by this urination problem. <laughs> so if you look at that, they're supposed to have one for every 100 people and they're supposed to have 20% more than that of people are drinking. So it's, it's if, it's, if you can see it, I think it's like fracking. If people weren't aware it's out of sight, out of mind, they don't realize how bad it is. Well, the same thing with none of us. I don't think anyone realizes how bad it is. A friend of mine uh, was trying to get to the hospital. Her husband was driving her, and she couldn't get to the hospital, and uh, she was having chest pain. And when she finally got there, the students all got there, wouldn't let them go through the hall, and did the same things to them. And she ended up going to the house with a backpack. It was serious. But I think people also need to realize that no violations, no arrests, no tickets are being made because of the law enforcement claims that it's too large of a crowd that they can't do anything. So in other words, they publicly admitted that they can't do their job because there's too many people. When they admitted to keep up about the Muslim Music Festival, he doesn't sell more than 7,000 tickets and he's never sold more than 4,500 and he can make money. <laughs> So then that he takes it and hiring people like Billy Nelson, then I don't understand why this guy can't be cut down based on his size. Something needs to be done about that request before someone dies because it's a really dangerous situation.
gardener, and I have little potted trees that keep coming up in my yard, and I can't bear to root them out, so eventually they'll get planted. They make the best gifts for people who've had babies or birthdays or anniversaries. I'm not joking. The trees you dig out of your flower bed sometimes are the best long-lasting trees that you can you can plant. So native natural genotypes. So we know they're gonna grow here. Yes, exactly. Let's go into the shade. <laughs> My name is Ann Bonner and I'm a, an urban forester with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and I've been a forester for 20 years with the state and this is the biggest outside tour that I've ever given. There are way too many of you. <laughs> but I'm so glad that that, there, that shows there's such an interest in trees and in this, this place. So I'll start with just the two rules that I give every person who I ever take into nature is we're a guest. Who are we a guest of today? Oh, you. Well, you, yeah. <laughs> the trees, we're a guest of the plants and animals that reside here. And so we act like guests, you know, no stomping on the bees and on the ants that might be in the path. And of course, you, I'm, I'm used to working with kids and politicians, so I have to say this thing today. My second rule, and this is going to really play out for a group this big, is that when I say the word sassafras, if you want to hear what I'm going to share, just stand at attention. But in my regular life, I don't work with the tree huggers. I only get called when there's a problem, <laughs> controversy, concern, usually after somebody's done something really stupid and something's wrong with the tree and how do, I, how do we fix it? <laughs> so it's really cool to be surrounded by people that really understand trees and like them. We'll start out by um, looking at these, these trees that line the walkway here. Let's look at these, these trees that line this, this area here. What do you notice different between these trees and the ones that are set back a little bit? Well, they're multi-stem. They're multi-stem and they're smaller. What do we call trees that are multi-stem and smaller and they usually hang out in the... What's that? Understory. The understory, yes. <laughs> yes. And in Ohio, we live in one of the most biologically diverse places in the world. It's really special. Our forests are are home to hundreds and hundreds, thousands of different creatures, um, from the tiniest little fungi and bacteria and microbes to pretty big animals, you know, like, like deer. <laughs> and there's about 125 species of tree that support them. And we have understory trees, the ones that are like in the shade and short, and, and then there's the tall towering, and what do we call those tall towering ones? Canopy? Sh shade trees are canopy trees, and, and canopy trees are most powerful tool in climate change in many environmental challenges that we're facing today, at least in, in the eastern United States. With that many trees and that much diversity, who here knows their trees? Can identify them. Who here wants a little crash course in tree ID? Yeah. With 125 different trees and 400 different shrubs, we follow some simple basic rules. Is the tree opposite branched or alternately branched? You have to get close, so I want to see some people touching trees here. Are the leaves coming out from the same spot, or are the leaves alternating up and down the stem? There's an old oak flower. You see where the leaves were? They come out from the same spot? They're opposite! There are only four trees that have opposite branching in southeast Ohio. Four trees! The maples, the ash, the dogwood, and the buckeye. So we call that mad buck. <laughs> so this is opposite branched. It can be one of four things, maple, ash, dogwood, or buckeye. Your story tree, spreading branch pattern, really pretty white flowers in spring, <laughs> clustered of red berries in the fall. What is it? The dogwood. Good job, good job. <laughs> now, just to complicate things, how many native dogwoods do we have in Ohio? There's quite a few. There's the cornice moss, there's the silky dogwood, the gray dogwood, the red twig dogwood. Those are all native, mostly like wet bottoms. Great food for wildlife. These dogwoods, the story goes that they were planted at the request of um, President Baker's wife, who was a great and famous tree hugger from At or in Athens at that time. I understand that he was president in the late 50s, early 60s. Did I get that right? So that puts these trees easily at 40 years old, it's hard to believe because they're so small. They are trees that right now have been, they're being discussed to be removed for better visibility of Cutler Hall. Oh. So, don't worry, don't worry. I think we got this covered. <laughs> so, How long would they normally live, Ann? Oh, a dogwood? Well, you know, there are stories of many of the trees in southeast Ohio and in, in the 
the, the mixed mesophytic forests of the eastern United States are very long lived. Like an oak can live 700 years. They've pulled sycamores out of the Ohio River, you know, like big old logs that counted the rings and there was a thousand rings. Wow. Dogwoods can live over, probably over 100 years as well. Oh, wow. Historically, they were so big, there are stories of them using being used for lumber. The wood is really hard. If you've ever pruned a dogwood or cut one down, it's not, as small as they are, it's not that fun. They're, the wood is really dense. I think they're actually a replant. Okay. That's my... It's very difficult to move trees. Transplanting trees is such an unnatural process in nature, it never happens. We can do things to kind of um, help things along, and we move trees all the time, but the bigger the tree, the harder it is to get them to live in the long term. So let's keep them. 1839, people were planting trees here. Who knows what these trees might be? Sycamore. Good. And who knows what the word sycamore means in at least one of the Native American languages? No, but that is a good, that's a very good guess. Where, white lady, oh, that's good. Is it ghost No. Something to do with water? You got it, water. Sycamore means water, and historically, these trees are part of um, what helped pioneers make it across the Appalachian Mountains and into the, the, the Midwest. One thing that we need every day is water, right? And when you're in the woods traveling, either walking or with a wagon, you can't travel near water because what is always near water? <coughs> Mud and bugs, right? I mean, to this, and can you imagine that back then? There was even more mud and more bugs. So you traveled the hilltops because that's where the buffalo trails were and that was dry, level, and direct. And that was gonna take you, hopefully, to where you wanted to go. But you could always find, look for the white, the white ladies to, um, you know, you, you knew that water would be there. Um, the cool thing about sycamores today, we plant them all over the place and they're very versatile, very tough. Uh, they can live a long time. And this tree can absorb a lot of carbon and a lot of, pollution and can live a long time. There's just one tiny problem with sycamores in the urban environment. Does anybody know what it is? Yeah, yeah they're, messy. they're messy. People get really mad. They love the idea of sycamores, but no one wants them in their front yard. Part of my white hair is because I have to go talk to the residents that have sycamores in their front yards. So I get yelled at a lot. If you were to guesstimate, what would be your best take on how old this tree might be? I, I, it's so hard to do that because really? trees will grow according to their environment. Trees are a lot like fish. If you take a little catfish and you put him in an aquarium, in nature he has the capacity to grow six foot if he's in the Ohio River. But in your aquarium he's only going to grow to the capacity of that environment. Trees are much the same. You know, they'll, they'll grow big in a really good favorable spot and they'll be stunted oftentimes in a not so good spot. Sycamores do tend to be pretty slow growing when they're older. They said sycamore was never a really popular tree to plant. It may have been here quite a long time, um, especially this close together. It's, it's always interesting. When I see trees, really big old trees really close together, sometimes it makes me think they might have just been naturalized. But when you're wondering about the age of a tree, go back and figure out the land use for that, that site. Because a lot of times the first thing people did when they plant, built houses back in the day was plant a tree. So the trees will coincide with the construction of that, that house. What do you mean by naturalized? They grew on their own. They okay. seeded by, you know, naturally seeded. They were here when they built the universe. Some of these master gardeners can tell me how many bugs and beetles and living things you might find in the canopy of this tree. Do you guys know? Do you remember from the... Not to put you... A lot. A million. <laughs> a million. <laughs> you get up in an oak tree or a sycamore, and just the, the buzzing around your back and the bugs and the, um, because these things are alive. They are supporting, you know, lots of life up there. And that's a good thing. Susan, are we, am I technically not allowed to pick anything off the trees? Sorry. <laughs> I know someone, right? <laughs> just a, what they call sucker sprout, but you've got a leaf coming there, a leaf coming there, you know? So is that opposite? It's alternate. So it can't be a maple, can't be an ash, can't be a dogwood or what else can it be? Okay. Yeah, okay. nomad buck. So this one is um, kind of, has a unique leaf, makes it easy to identify. Oh, and there's a bunch of aphids put on around on the back side of that. That's a good thing too. Life is good. Hey, if the environment can support the tiniest of little creatures, it can support us. What you, when you really get worried is when you don't see any bugs. That's when we're screwed. Sweet gum, liquid ambar, stryrusophila? 
So anybody know anything about sweet gum? What do you know? <laughs> they are really favorite food of many caterpillars, including the famous Luna moth larva caterpillar. So, Oh, you are a tree hugger because most people hate these trees. These trees are actually outlawed in many cities because of these sweet gum balls. Has anybody ever been to Europe? Have you seen the horse chestnuts that line the streets that have gigantic, horrible, see, and that they've tolerated these trees for hundreds of years and we can't tolerate a sweet gum. I cannot tell you more gray hair from beginning yelled at over sweet gum balls. They're so beautiful in the fall. They are so beautiful in the fall. This is a really tough tree. If you have a really tough site, a new house where you've just, you know, the topsoil has been destroyed, this is a tree that can thrive on neglect. Um, these are the trees that we plant along um, in the highway. Um, they're really good at resisting lawnmower damage. I mean, not that we'd ever want to uh, think that a lawnmower should touch a tree, but they have pretty thick bark. They're pretty drought tolerant. And again, it's a really, really tough tree. When the big, big storms hit in the early 90s in Marietta and Athens, big floods, there's a lot of wind with these storms. And in Marietta, um, the day after the storm, the tree commission and I went out and we inventoried all the storm damage. And we found a lot of trees had fallen down. Not a single sweet gum had fallen down. They have roots to China. <laughs> no, they are really spreading. But the only thing we'd notice is that they they, they lost their tops a little bit. Um, and, and it was really consistent through every single one in the, in the city. Or anybody that has a sweet gum is truly a true lover, tree lover. <laughs> yes, wet, compacted soil. Yeah, very versatile. So this tree, is it opposite branched or alternately branched? Alternate. Alternately branched in a simple leaf. What are those holes on the leaves? What's causing that? Bugs? Bugs, yeah. That's the tulip tree weevil. It's a native little weevil with a little snout. It's really, they're really cute, but they, they're not, not good. Yeah, not, not good for the tulip tree. Tulip poplar, it's sometimes called. Believe it or not, though, it's not a true poplar. It's actually in the magnolia group. It has really pretty flowers. Um, I've actually seen hummingbirds go into a, the, 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 the flower is like a tulip, it's like a yellow orange tulip. The sad thing about it is they're always up high and this is a really tall tree and so rarely people don't get to see it. But I've seen the hummingbirds just taking drinks out of that, out of that flower. So this is one that's not planted very often in the urban environment, but it should be used more. It's really tall and straight. It's probably our most important timber tree right now. Uh, probably even more important than the oaks. It's probably cut more than the The Native Americans used this tree to build their canoes because it was so straight. And so when you're looking in the woods and you see a tree like that are growing out of hollows and stuff, um, out of you know the, the, the slopes, they're really tall and straight, chances are they're a tulip tree. What about those cuts on the trunk? Oh, those are, um, that's called the branch bark ridge. And if you can tell, those are where the branches were pruned off like a, what they call a, a wound or wound wood and this is actually a sign that somebody did a very good job pruning this tree when you see a wound and it's completely covered and it's completely round and symmetrical you know that that was a good cut so trees self prune themselves all the time you want to mimic that and if you think about how a, na a natural branch grows it's here's my arms a branch and say this you know I'm connecting to the trunk right here so a branch that uh, that grows on its own on a tree, every year the tree puts on a new ring of growth, right? It gets fatter here, but around here it grows around, it grows like a knot around that that, tr that branch. And that becomes really strong. And if you've ever seen, like if you've been in a hurricane and you've seen where they ripped off, it's, it's amazing. And I don't know if you know this, but pound for pound, wood is stronger than steel. So wood is lignin and cellulose. I'm telling you, the stored energy from the sun is, is long lasting and really strong. And so the, this is just probably where that that twi that rounding of that tissue just cracks where the, uh, you know where, on the bark. But it's a very common thing. And when you're pruning, you look for the branch bark ridge because you want to make your cuts actually perpendicular to that. Get a lot of sucker sprouting after the tree's been pruned and new branches. Those new branches never get to form that 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 ball and socket joint. And those are the branches that fall in storms. And this is why we see accelerated tree damage along public rights of ways where like trees have been buzzed by the sidearm mower or trees have been pruned improperly by, you know, the streets superintendent who, you know, 
mad at his wife or something. <laughs> but a tree that that actually has those original branches, thats and we call it scaffold branching, that is incredibly strong and, and it can last for, for centuries and withstand incredible storms. And as our trees get older, they're not quite as able to fight things off and they'll start to get thin in the top and those bugs will, you know, start to uh, take advantage. <laughs> but it's pretty rare, I, I, it's pretty rare that they'll kill it. They'll just be probably a, a factor It's shortening its life so. <laughs> it, yes, it's not native, but it's a... Top as nails. It, this is a, a, what we call a European beech uh, or a copper beech. Um, these, tr they're close cousins to the American beech um, that is native in our woods. Uh, really slow, slow growing trees. Um, just a beautiful, unique tree, not very common. Um, it's a lot of space. A lot of space. Yeah. And they're, they have pretty delicate roots. They built a new house. You wouldn't want to plant this in your front yard. You know, this is one that needs a natural soil horizon, you know, and a really primo spot. It's shady, protected. Could this have been limbed up more? No, I would hate for us all to have the same haircuts. I, I think it's cool whenever possible, especially in the public landscape, to allow trees where there's space to have low branches because we want kids to climb them. We want people to touch them. And one of the many tragedies in the nursery industry is that they limb every single tree up. It's like McDonald's. Every tree is limbed up seven feet, whether it's ready to be or not. New branches that they might put out later on are not gonna have that, that ball and socket joint that I talked about. So anytime you can keep a lower branch, keep it. My husband hates that. No, it really likes to be in the shade. This okay. one does, yeah. Oh, and there are shade tolerant trees and not shade tolerant trees. Um, the oaks are not shade tolerant. And that's why a lot of times you're not gonna see a lot of lower branches on an oak. Uh, maples, beeches, they like to shade. They like to be cuddled up, you know, they like shade. What you experience under the tree is totally different from when you're looking at it at a distance because of the way each individual leaf is colored. Yes, yeah, they're really beautiful. Yeah. So if you look at these two trees right here, this, this beauty and this one right what can you tell me about their leaves that are the same? Can you guys see up there? I heard compound, compound leaves. This is one leaf. You know, if you were to, to, to pick off a, a natural place for the, for the leaf to disconnect with the stem, um, it's a compound leaf. And so they both have compound leaves. Now, this is gonna test all of our eyesight. <laughs> is this one opposite branched or alternately branched? Can you see? It's alternate. We just know that it's alternate. <laughs> and how do we know that it's alternate? <laughs> because we know that maple, ash, dogwood, or buckeye don't have these. And what are these? Walnuts. These are actually, this one's an old walnut, and this is an aborted walnut. It's really common for trees. Trees are so smart. In, in nature, they might all get, all those flowers got pollinated and all have got f fertilized, but that tree knows. It doesn't have the strength to, to create all those nuts and make them sexually mature so they can be new trees. So it naturally aborts some. This is really common. All trees do this from your pear peach trees that you might plant. Hickories do it. Uh, they can gauge how much strength they have. Um, yep. So anyone know what this one is behind it? Can, can we, is it opposite? We know it's compound leaves. Is it opposite leaves or uh, alternate? And um, we, I have one here that fell down. Those of you that are close, you can kind of see, and this tree is not growing very fast. Um, there's not a lot of stem elongation here, so it's hard to see, but I see a leaf right there, and I see a leaf right there. So, it's opposite, and you got it, Tim. Can you tell the group? It's an ash tree. It's an ash tree, yes. Maple ash, dogwood, and buckeye, opposite branch. So, anybody want to tell us what they know about ash trees? Dying. <laughs> yeah, why are they dying? Emerald ash borer. Yeah, all right. You know how many places I go where people have not heard of the emerald ash borer? <laughs> so the emerald ash borer, for those of you who don't know, is a tiny flathead borer that came here from China on shipping crates in the, I guess they're saying now in the late to mid to late 90s. It uh, was found first um, off near shipping, a shipping port in Detroit. 
and this 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 pest spread throughout the, our native ash trees all all the way to Chicago and is now working its way through Athens County and beyond. Um, it's in West Virginia, Maryland. Um, we found that it mostly gets spread by people. The other day, I was putting a saddle pad on my horse, and there was an emerald ash borer stuck to the cotton on my saddle pad. Or, you know, they travel on your wheel wells. What's that? Why would you just? There's no point. I mean, there's there's millions of them. There's no known reprieve from this insect. They've pretty much worked their way down, killing all the ash. They have found what they call lingering ash, one to two percent um, of the remaining ash in an ecosystem for some reason are not being killed and researchers with the U.S. Forest Service are now studying those and taking um, samples of those in hopes to find some resistance. Um, there's also some efforts to breed back American ash trees with the Chinese species and the European species, but guess what? And this is true of pretty much all of um, the species the, the coinciding species between our continents. The American species are stately and large and long-lived, and the Asian species are short and just not as beautiful. Um, and maybe, I know, is that, that sounds bad coming out that way, I'm sorry. But, but like, think about the Chinese chestnut. It's a really stout, round tree, and the American chestnut was, you know, 100 foot tall and tall and straight. Same with the ash. The Manchurian ash is, it's ugly. <laughs> quite sad to, to see that we'll be losing these ash trees. Um, this ash tree probably does have the emerald ash borer. Oh yes, it's on campus. Oh yes, I've already, we've been pecking away. Keep yeah. it safe, keep it in safe. The, 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 the bad thing about the emerald ash borer is that it's, it's real quiet. You don't notice that your tree has it. It likes the soft young wood in the top of the tree, so that's where they colonize first. And that tree will, you know, trees are tough, so the first couple of years, the borer, bore, you know, lays his eggs, bores in there, and that tree compartmentalizes the damage, you know, grows new wood around it. And after about four or five years, the tree just cannot keep keep up with it. And and more and more, and the, the bug is a lazy flyer, so it will lay, what, how many hundred, I mean, probably thousands of eggs on the same tree. So you'll have one tree that's completely decimated at, before they'll go to the next tree. But it takes about five years. So you have about five tree years. And the one thing that, um, I've learned the hard way in my yard, you don't want to wait till these die to take them down. Because ash wood is really brittle, so it's really more expensive for the arborists to cut them down when they're dead and brittle, and also it's unpredictable. The wood can fall unpredictably and stuff. Um, but since you know ahead of time, when's the best time to remove trees that we have to remove? In the height of nesting season in the spring? <laughs> no! <laughs> There's laws against that. and. Good sense is against that. So I always say when I'm doing, I want to be operated on when I'm asleep. <laughs> Do all your tree operations when they're asleep, and that's when. You need fall and winter. That's about now. If it's an emergency and you've got a hazard, of course, you know that takes precedent. But by and large, we should plan to do our tree work when trees are dormant. If they start at the top, how do you know they're diseased? Well, you don't, and that causes a lot of controversy. <laughs> so, for that, I heard on NPR about a month ago that there are two world seed banks and one is in I want to say Sweden, Sweden or Denmark yeah like in this mountain and it's this is our tax dollars at work uh, but because one is in America and one's in Europe um, and there's probably other ones but I know the US Forest Service when this first came out they had us collecting seed and we sent the seed to Delaware Ohio and um, you know they are they are collecting the seed do some freezing and if you have tropical trees they often will not freeze they don't have a hibernation period so those are not very good yeah, they can't save those as easily. But I actually read an article about ash that in the north, um, where they have very, very cold spells, they can, they'll can they knock back the emerald ash borer, and then the tree is resistant enough that it will persist. Oh. So there's, you know, the issue of climate change that could oh, <laughs> yeah. negatively impact that. But it's possible that in the northern area. It's, it's not specific <laughs> green ash, white ash. Yeah, all pumpkin black, green, white. I think there's five, I'm forgetting, blue, blue ash, I think there's five species in the eastern United States, They're, they've all been, now they prefer the white first, um, so they'll go for the white first and then the green, but they, they, I guess blue, which we don't have a lot of blue ash in Athens, blue ash is the one that's kind of stout and ugly, it's got a square stem, um, there's a few out in the Stroud's Run area, but they're not a real common tree. But it's a pretty sad story, ash comprises um, statistically one-tenth of our forest here, so we're losing one in ten trees. And there's some animals that are totally 
There are. There are. I learned that there are 41 species of insect that are obligate to the ash tree, and so no one really knows what the cascading impacts will be on our ecosystems, and you know the animals that eat those bugs, and the animals that eat those animals, and so on and so on. So quite quite tragic. Are, were you going to say something about gypsy moth? Okay. We have, we'll a, get we have a lot of ash trees in the city of Athens. Do we have a plan to we do cut them down and because they're everywhere? Yeah, it's and some it's, of them are really huge. It's getting scary um, because, as I said, um, it's really almost all the cities that I serve have gone through this or are in some process of going through this. Um, there's that like denial at first. Like my tree, my husband's going through this right now, Tim. I'm like, denial, my ash trees are going to be the ones that live. You know? <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, the slow, like, anger, dang it, you know. And, and then, so it takes a long time, and um, by then the trees are dead and dangerous. Um, and Athens actually was really uh, proactive. Originally, um, what, 10, 10 years ago, I think you guys inventoried all the ashes in the city. Yeah, so we inventoried, right. Yeah, so in 2006, so they knew where all the ash trees, they stopped planting ash. Uh, so that's put them ahead of the game. Um, and they've removed some. One of the challenges is a lot of the ash trees are in waste areas or kind of out of the way places where it's, you know, ownership is nebulous, um, you know, the backsides of parking lots and stuff like that. So I'm not sure where all that's at. Um, but we, we do know that ash trees that are in that are city trees. And there's a plan for taking those down. The, ch the challenges of good forest management is that uh, no one notices. Some of the cities, especially near Detroit and Northwest Ohio, when the Emerald Ash Borer infiltrated those cities, the, all the trees died at the same time and there was like mayhem and people were so upset. And so there was the political will and the resources to remove the trees and plant new ones. Here, you know, we've, Marietta has been removing trees for since probably 2006, like Athens. And so they've pretty much got theirs down and so people just go about their business not even recognizing that there's this huge environmental calamity happening. It's like in urban forestry, you get, you get um, praised when you don't do anything, you know? <laughs> One of the uh, negatives of international trade is just what happens when they get away. They're sacrificing the environment and sacrificing 10% of North American native trees so we can all wear cheap underwear or some other cheap product. Yeah. Think about not only jobs, but yeah. It's more than that. If we import to China, we export to China, we have to do it on plastic pallets. They won't let us. Yeah. It's the trade deficit is very unbalanced, and this is definitely a byproduct of global trade. There are um, standards and rules um, for stuff coming into our country. And I, I should have, the, the statistics of how much comes in every day. I mean, I heard something like 10,000 shipping crates every day fall off. Like the, to inspect. Yeah, yeah, 2%, less than, they say actually 2% of the boxes ever get inspected, 2%. Um, and so it's not just forest risks, it's also agriculture. There have been a lot of um, pests that have, that have impacted um, wheat, corn, you know, which just increases our reliance on chemicals and um, artificial means to, 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 to practice, you know, agriculture here and forestry and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, these are definitely things we need to be aware of. Well beyond the scope of my job in urban forestry. You know? <laughs> um, let's go look at a really amazingly beautiful tree. Um, all right, tell me about this tree. Is this got simple leaves or compound leaves? Can you tell? There's a leaf. Compound leaf. Is it opposite branched or alternately branched? The leaves are alternating up the stem, right? Yeah. yeah, so this is alternately branched. So it's not a maple ash dog or buckeye. And something else is unique about this tree. Notice what's dangling below the ends of each twig. What do you see? Yes, little peas. Little peas. So this is a legume. It's a pretty big family of plants. A nitrogen fixer. Uh, anybody know what this tree is? This is a native to a little bit south of here. I, I didn't know this tree until I came to Adams. I didn't. I, we didn't have yellow woods in northeast Ohio, Indiana, you know? Indiana has a state, state forest named yellow woods because they have so much of it. Oh, wow. 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 It is beautiful. This tree like flowers. That. It's the most beautiful flowering tree maybe, what, a month ago? It's it's kind of got white, white, just um, dappling flowers. 
uh, great small, it's considered a medium sized tree. This is a really old specimen. The question was, are they edible? I don't know. I don't know. I've never heard that they're poisonous, but a lot of, most things, a lot of things are edible in nature. They just don't taste very good, you know, <laughs> unless you fry them in grease. <laughs> so what, what else can I say about yellowwood? If you're interested in growing a yellowwood, this is a hard one to grow. It's very slow growing. This tree is really special. This tree has got to be really old. Um, I've seen them live and die in, in many cities that I serve. This is by far the biggest one I've ever seen. Are they all vase shaped? Um, they are. They do tend to be vase shaped. And so it's, it's kind of a nice medium sized tree. You could almost plant them under wires, you know, if, if, if you had space this way. But they really need a lot of love and affection when they're young. A lot of mulch, regular water, even the sight of a lawnmower going towards them, they do not like that. <laughs> yeah, those are dogwoods. And dogwoods just see a lawnmower and they, they, you can see that, you know, they're, they're not good. Is the wood yellow? Um, is the wood yellow? I don't know. I've never pruned one. They're so beautiful. I never touch them. You no, know, and, and Marietta's got a lot of these in their streets and stuff. And we rarely prune them. Are there any others around campus? Oh, down Mulberry Alley, right before Morton on the right. Okay. Another lovely specimen, not that big, okay. but very healthy. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're not they're not very common, but um, but by all means, you guys, you know, if you're into trees, this is one to, to plant in your yard. I mean, there it's, are a lot of saplings at the base. <laughs> oh, are they? They're there are. Difficult? It's it does germinate readily. Oh, okay. So the seeds are. Oh, you can almost yeah. collect seed. Okay, so sassafras. Everybody take a deep breath. Do you smell the glyphosate? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, managing a university is a big challenge because you're not managing it for yourself. You're managing it for, a, um, for the public, but also for um, higher ups that, that have certain demands on them. If you go to Polaris or Columbus and you, or even Cincinnati, you drive the outskirts and you see these giant corporations with the big square buildings and the big estates and Canada geese and the perfect lawns and big trees. That's what everybody's going for these days. To achieve that kind of landscape requires a lot of chemicals. There's just no way around it. So it's kind of up to us if we don't want landscapes like that, we've got to be vocal and um, help managers justify the reasons for not doing that. What would this place look like if we didn't, if they weren't treating for weeds? They probably have some daff, dandelions and plantain and we need a lot plantain. more labor and more hand labor. Well, or you just decide that plantain was okay. Yeah. You know, that like, I like plantain. Leave the white clover alone. <laughs> yeah. The bees, it's the same height as the grass. Yeah. Decision makers increasingly in this world come from the private sector. And the private sector looks at this stuff way different than we do in the public sector, and um, and they don't know. They just see green. They just see beautiful carpet of green and big trees. They're not around on Sunday mornings when it's being blasted and broadcast with a million fertilizers and chemicals. And so it's kind of up to us to, to kind of say, hey, yeah, we, we don't mind clover and broadleaf. Broadleafs. We call it broadleaf. We you know they're. But but can you guys smell the glyphosate? It's sure strong right here. I do want to share with you, this is a towering willow oak. Is it state champion or not? Second? Second? It's not the biggest in the state. Right. Crazy. So willow oak, second largest willow oak in Ohio. Pretty, pretty amazing tree, beautiful. Um, it, it's a nice maple behind it, but it makes it look dinky. <laughs> and then this right here, I learned on G, at Gene Andrews tour that no one knows what species elm this is i would think that it looks like an american elm by virtue of its vase shaped form and kind of the craggly bark no i thought it was decided it was it was american it has all the characteristics of american that i learned uh, it was a hybrid between siberian and american which is very interesting because siberian elms um, are not native here although they do naturalize and i mean they're not an invasive or anything some sort of cross-pollination you know some Thank you, thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> but it's it's a magnificent tree. Um, the elms 
were decimated um, in Ohio in the 40s by Dutch elm disease. Um, it was a disease that was brought over here by accident, um, I think by gardeners. Um, it got to here in the 40s. I mean, it was here er in America earlier, but it got, and it's still working its way west. If you go to Minnesota, they still have American ash or American elm. Um, you know, it's just now getting them now. So it's just kind of this disease is kind of marching its way across America slowly, but, but surely. Um, to this day, they say every year you've got a one in 10 chance if you've got an elm tree of getting Dutch elm disease. It moves on the feet of the native elm bark beetle. It's a tiny little bark beetle that gravitates towards any wound. So if you have a big storm and your, and your tree gets a big wound in the spring, or if you decide to prune your tree in the spring, despite you know not listening to Ann Bonner's recommendations about <laughs> not pruning in the spring, those elm bark beetles will just, they can smell it. And they come, and they don't necessarily hurt the tree themselves, but the fungus gets carried on their feet and uh, slowly, slowly kill that tree. It takes, what, two, three years? Yeah, something like that. And, but this is one case where the hybrids are pretty, they've been successful in making a million hybrids, and yes. I'm, I'm a big fan, and we have an elm collection on campus, and some of them are pretty stately. Yeah. Have a, have a, have a nice form, somewhat emulating the lovely shape. Yes, yeah, Susan's planted different, seven, eight. Okay, it's different varieties. Yeah. yeah. And these are, and, and interesting, if this one had, Siberian elm is not susceptible to Dutch elm disease. So interesting that if it truly does have um, Siberian elm genes, that's probably helping to keep it alive. The, again, the silver lining to the black cloud of Dutch elm disease, the fewer elms you have, the fewer bar, el, elm bark beetles that you have. And so that's why the few, like, like Marietta, um, has 12 left on their streets and they're big like this um, and they've they've lasted they've maybe lost two in the last 20 years that I've been working with them it's because there's not that you know there's not the vector yeah, we so. see one one happy note is the McCracken expansion that just fired up what a week and a half ago we protected a monster American out in the corner if anybody's been up, down uh, is it cost cost or playground what runs out of that Siegfried lot right back to Stewart but in the corner right against the rentals is a monster Beautiful American elm. And you've and been taking care we, of that we, for... we fought through it with the architects. They redesigned the parking lot and we kept it outside the construction fence. So. But I did find a futon there at the end of the fest with a rope and bottles <laughs> hanging from it. And oh my, so I don't know what we'll do going forward about advertising what a great tree that is. Stay off it. <laughs> you created this uh, really great place that everybody wants to hang out. Right next to the rentals. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Well, you've been treating that tree as well, right? Oh, right, we've treated yeah. twice. Yeah. Preventative. Do you, so you haven't, did you ever see symptoms of it? Never, or no? never, okay. never. It's very healthy so far. And that's one of the cool things. There are treatments for Dutch elm disease. There are treatments for the emerald ash borer as well. Um, you can do soil drenches or um, Injection. injections. Uh, but the challenge with the emerald ash borer is that there's just so many beetles right now. We're in this gigantic wave and um, it, you know, even I've seen trees that have been treated that still are just polluted with the beetle. But borers are the hardest insect to kill, even with the toughest, most deadly of chemicals, um, because they're hiding in your wood. When, when bugs uh, start on the east coast, because the prevailing winds move go westerly for the most part, it, can, it slows them down. That's why it's taken so long for Dutch elm disease to make it to, to, Amer to Ohio and, and west. But Gypsy moth is a, is a caterpillar, turns into a moth. Um, females don't fly, so it's a pretty slow-moving pest. Do you want the party line or my opinion? <laughs> <laughs> the state pe spends millions of dollars trying to control gypsy moth and slow the spread. It, out east, like in, in New York and in um, Pennsylvania, where they have really high volume of oak tree. They've had a lot of die-offs from gypsy moth. They've had big, big outbreaks. And so that's scary. Uh, it, it, that's our industry. I mean, the logging industry is big in, in all, our whole region. There is a naturally occurring fungus called the entomophica, wait, entom my omega. It en entomophica. <laughs> entomophica my omega. It is, yes, it loves cool, wet springs. And this fungus somehow gets into the digestive tract of these tiny little caterpillars, kills them. And it slows the spread naturally of the gypsy moth. Because we have really healthy woods for the most part and vast woods, we have this fungus. Uh, we have not seen the outbreaks 
here in Southeast Ohio that they have in other states. Now they have had some, where they get the big outbreaks are fancy estates where there's lawn and big trees. Because in a turf setting, there's no fungus, there's no bacteria in the soil, or very little. There's not a lot of microbes in the soil, it's a dead soil. But out here, you know, where we ha have native forest ecosystems that are functioning, this fungus has done pretty well. And I've been seeing, I've seen gypsy moth, caterpillars. I first saw them at Alvin McWilliams house 20 years ago. So it's been here. It's just never been a problem. So I, I am not a big fan. Um, the BT sprays kill all kinds of Lepidoptera, and the Lepidoptera are the other cat. The other we don't realize. You know, all butterflies and moths, as beautiful as they are, and there's hundreds and hundreds of species of them in Ohio. They all, at one stage of their life, are little creepy. Yeah, they're caterpillars that eat our flowers, and we have to just like get over that. You know, when I was younger, like I'd be like swabbing the caterpillars out of my flowers, and now I'm like, when I see them, I'm happy. I'm all for it. I don't even doesn't, doesn't kill the plant. Just you have to. When you can't change the world, you just change your perspective on it. And, um, and if we need to make our world tolerable for those little little guys, because then it'll be tolerable for us and our kids and our grandkids and all that. But So I'm not a fan of that program. And my bosses know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, with some of the outbreak with the oak, gypsy boss, it's with a solid oak. Yeah. yeah. There was nothing else. When you have a mixed forest, when you have maples and other trees, it, it's, it tends to not be as devastating. Yeah, and I, I think it was spreading so fast at that time too because of the widespread oak. And so those populations built so high because of this program that there's been a lot of studies. They, they actually go out and count egg masses and everything. But once the, the, the worst part of an infestation, a non-native invasive infestation, whether it's a bug, disease, fungus, you know, whatever, is that front line, just like a fire. The, the, the worst part's the front line of the fire. That's when it burns the hottest, does the most damage. We've passed that here. We've, we're done with gypsy moth. We have it now. And so the ecosystem has b been able to respond. For example, the average scarlet tanager, I have read, can eat a thousand gypsy moths in a day. Larva, when they're small. Now granted, when they get big, they don't like to eat them because they're hairy and probably don't <laughs> taste good. But, but you know, I mean, have you ever watched a bird methodically? Will walk up the stem of a tree looking for underneath, you know, getting caterpillars. That's what they do. That's what they do. The way they switch from BT to something else. I don't know how. To yeah, the gyp tracks. So, so because of people like you who have been vocal and concerned about Lepidoptera and the non-target species that are impacted by the chemicals they use to kill the gypsy moth, there's a chemical that's called gyp check, and it's a pheromone disruptor, and it's on these little plastic chips, and and it doesn't it supposedly does not impact other Lepidoptera, but it puts out the pheromone and confuses the male moths and so they can't find a mate. And it slows the spread. So, And the cool thing about gypsy moth is the female doesn't fly. So if you can confuse the guys long enough, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this tree is awfully close to that building. It's a root system. Problem? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. You guys have the best questions. My job would be so much better if I worked with people like you every day. Tree roots only grow where it's hospitable for them. They have no reason to grow underneath the building or into a foundation. They're going to grow, they're looking for two things in life, water and air and some nutrients. And that's found near the surface of the soil, where that O layer, the humus layer of the soil is. Where we have conflicts with trees, and infrastructure is um, usually when the infrastructure comes in after the tree and also our old way of constructing sidewalks was we would put gravel uh, lay gravel down compact it but then lay gravel but gravel has what between the gravel lots of big spaces air and water what trees love right <laughs> and then we put the concrete on top of that and it was cool and more and that and so the tree roots go onto the sidewalk and bust the sidewalk up so today, nowadays, or I try to, the, <laughs> the cities that I work, I try to get them to use bug dust or a crushed limestone instead. I hope that's becoming the norm now, but even if you're doing a project at home, if you compact the soil and get rid of that air and that water, the root roots don't want to go there. When they're big, they're tough. I am embarrassed to say how many tree roots that I have seen cut and cut myself in my, in my job. I mean, we, it, let's face it, if you're gonna have trees, in infrastructure in urban areas compromise but you can often resolve that conflict with good practices young trees 
are often more of a problem with infrastructure because remember I was telling you, you trees are like people when we're young we grow really fast and we're changing a lot and that's where the trees are going to bust out due to damage but we don't notice it till the tree's big when a tree's done growing it's done growing you could do a lot of stuff around them but as long as you do it right and Susan's really good about that she always is trying to making sure that the specifications are written in these contracts with these contractors that you know are trying to upheave the <laughs> the, the, the campus. It's been a lot of construction in the last 20 years. You've grown by leaps and bounds. I want to leave you wanting more, not hating me. So <laughs> um, I just thank you so much for your time and your interest. Nice and job. Come back. So Susan's going to lead a tour in a couple weeks. I think you did not get asked yet. She doesn't know this yet. We're on her. I think I'm getting recruited. <laughs> and we're going to do some other tours, so keep, keep your eye on the newspaper and stuff, and we're going to explore the shrubs and the bushes.